International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and then uh, the lovely Nancy will introduce our moderator, Rory Monshrein. And then the moderator will facilitate discussion for around 30 minutes before we get into the question and answer period. Uh, during that time, feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat and we'll love to highlight them and uh, engage you with those uh, remarks. Now, before we get started, a couple of notes. Um, as you may have heard, this event is being recorded and will be available for the public to watch in our archive of GEOS events. Um, please check it out and share it with people who may not be able to attend today's session uh, to ensure that everyone is able to access today's programming. If you need ASL interpretation, please click open the meeting in Zoom if you're on the splash page to watch this event through that platform. This will enable you to view the interpreter and make sure that your remarks can also be included. Lastly, if you have questions for our speakers, a reminder to put those in the Q&A session chat. And uh, we will also be having poll questions as a way to engage the audience today. Um, so we, uh, we can test one of those out now, if that's OK, Katrina, um, to make sure that everyone is comfortable using the Zoom uh, programming. So I believe you can now see a pop-up box if you're on the Zoom that asks, according to the CDC, how many adults in the US live with a disability? Um, 61 million, 50 million, 45 million, 29 million. Um, and this is all, remember, disability numbers in the US. Um, so please make your best educated guess now. Um, although, of course, this number may not always include people who have not been registered with the CDC or um, are not always familiar with like the registration platforms and things like that surrounding disability. Right now that some answers are trickling in, um, we have a range of different answers. For, um, so around the a half said 40 or 43% of participants said 61 million. That was our leading response. Then 50 million, then 29 million. Um, but uh, so this would be an example of a poll question that we could ask for today's event. Um, and uh, the correct answer, I believe, uh, Katrina, if you don't mind sharing. The correct answer is actually 61 million adults, according to the CDC, are currently in the U.S. living with a disability. Wow, so we're off to a really great start. So congrats, everyone, uh, who got that right. And without further ado, I wanted to introduce the ILO video that I mentioned with A.D. Barkin in honor of International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you all so much. Today, more than 1 billion people, 15% of the world's population, live with a disability. The COVID-19 crisis has increased inequalities in society. And persons with disabilities who are already subject to discrimination and exclusion have been hit particularly hard. They have faced further marginalization in social, economic, and health terms. We need concrete commitments to identify, support, and involve persons with disabilities to ensure a sustainable recovery. I am Audie Barkin. I am Bradley Whitford. And together, we show solidarity with the ILO to call on countries to uphold the rights and improve inclusion of persons with disabilities. It's a matter of social justice and our common investment in building a better future. Persons with disabilities shouldn't continue to face so many barriers. You can help remove these. Raise your voice for inclusion. Perfect. Uh, now that we've seen the video, I'll pass it over to Nancy to introduce our moderator and the speakers. Thank you, Angela. Um, December 3rd was International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and we want to continue our conversation today for International Day of Human Rights. 
Um, Audie Barkin's waging a campaign to achieve Medicare for all and his new movie, Not Going Quietly, is streaming on several platforms. Um, it's my privilege today to introduce the speakers and who will join Mallory and our moderator for a rousing conversation. Um, if you have a question for the speakers, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, Professor Michael Ashley Stein is the co-founder and executive director of Harvard Law School Project on Disabilities and a Harvard professor. Um, he participated in drafting the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Carlos Rios Espinosa is a senior researcher and advocate for the disability rights division and a lawyer and an expert on international disability rights. Our moderator, Rory Mondeschind, is um, a UNA USA National Council member and a member of the UNA USA DEA and I Task Force, Diversity, Equity, Equality and Accessibility and Inclusion. Um, I'm turning it over to you, Rory. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. It is truly an honor to get to moderate this discussion in my capacity as a member of the UNA USA DEAI Task Force, as well as the first openly disabled delegate to represent the United States at the G20 Youth Summit. So before I get started on asking some more questions, I wanna set a foundation for understanding today's discussion. And I'd like to ask specifically, what is the current landscape of disability rights? And what are some key priorities that people are asking for? So if anybody wants to jump in, that would be ideal. I wanna make this an open space uh, from our speakers. Well, we have, we have millennia of um, stigma and exclusion. We have centuries of institutionalized exclusion in employment, education, and social participation. Um, more recently on the front of the newspaper, we've seen the exclusion of people with disabilities from climate change, specifically our friend, Minister Kareen, uh, who couldn't physically get into COP26. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, NGOs have not been including disability. There's only been one piece written about disability and climate change. It's you know by my wife, uh, and so there are many many pressing issues. And of course, we're living in a world that is decidedly turned to the right, and that means that those of us who are marginalized must stick together and and work together in order to ensure good participation for all of us. So I guess one of the big issues we're looking at is allyship and how do we ensure social participation for all? I would add that uh, millions of uh, people with disabilities um, are stripped of their legal right to legal capacity. And that, as you know, uh, legal capacity is a threshold of, of two other rights and it, it's an outrage that still uh, many people are disenfranchised. As we saw with the Britney Spears hearings, you, know, you can see the outrage, you know, um, what is happening to many, many uh, people with disabilities. Uh, there are still many of them, uh, millions of them living in institutions um, without the opportunity to decide where, uh, who and um, how to live and with whom to live. And uh, even the, those uh, rights are, are, are really uh, abused no, uh, to them. Um, also, uh, an important issue is the lack of cross-cutting policies no, to address, uh, for example, in the US, police violence against people with disabilities. That is a huge issue that uh, impacts uh, black communities and, um, and people and, and, and Latin people also in the US. So that is something that also has uh, ne needs to be addressed. Also, many people with disabilities live in poverty. You know? mm -hmm. uh, many of them uh, live in, in, in low income countries, but even in, in high income countries, you, know, you can see that um, uh, we don't have enough statistics to 
determine when someone is suffering from poverty and they just go hidden, no, because of the extra cost of disability, which I hope we can have a chance to uh, spoke more, speak more uh, further. Thank you. And to build upon that, you know, from my perspective, this is Mallory here. One of the one of the things we see a lot of is this conversation of societal stigma, right? And this narrative that we've built around disability. And there's been a lot of conversation across multiple demographics around allyship in the past couple of years. And I think there's an element as somebody who came into the disability community 13 years ago and had the perspective of 18 years without and now 13 years with of society not knowing what they don't know. But at some point that can't be the excuse anymore. And how do we course correct these misconceptions and these stigmas that exist, which frankly much are rooted in lack of authentic representation in our society. And so that trickles down to lack of opportunities and employment that trickles down to if there's not employment, funding and housing and education and all these areas where we're seeing underrepresentation and inaccessibility and, and, and equality in access for individuals in the disability community. Absolutely. And I think that you guys sort of touched on this, right? There's so much intersectionality. Professor Stein, you were talking about the intersections between climate change and people with disabilities. Uh, Mr. Espinosa, you were talking, Mr. Rios Espinosa, you were talking about um, the relationship between poverty and disability. And Mallory, you were talking about the importance of representation and how that affects people's rights. So I guess I'm going to go into my second question, which it talk, which refers to the idea of the SDGs and how uh, we can ensure global peace and prosperity and talk about the intersections and promote cross-sectional advocacy. So for those of you that don't know, the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals are a call to action on how we can ensure global peace and prosperity, which includes goals such as sustainable cities and communities, reduced inequalities, and no poverty. And our chapters across the country do work in their communities to make progress towards these goals. So I guess I would like to know more from you guys about the intersections between disability rights and the other SDGs. I, I mean, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, there is a lack of data uh, specifically on, on people who are poor, but they're not considered poor you know, by the regular statistics that uh, the countries uh, gather. You know? uh, for example, well, now there is a, a, a critique on the way the World Bank is measuring poverty, you know? and they are starting to introduce what uh, they're calling multidimensional uh, criteria not to, 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 to measure poverty. But however, even with uh, the criteria that is established there and which is focused on deprivations, no, for example, access to health, access to education, access to water, there are other things that go invisible no, because they are not considered by the statistics. For example, does a person have a, a, a chance to have friends? No. Um, you wouldn't ask that and you wouldn't consider that no, in the regular uh, measures no, to, to, to address poverty, no? because you assume that even if you're poor, no, well, you, you'll be able to get around and to get out and, and, and sort of like mingle with others. No? But when, when you have a disability, that might not be the case. No? You might not have a personal assistance no, to get you out of bed. And, and, then you, and that is a big issue for many people. No? So, I think that there needs to be further research no, on how to measure poverty and how to uh, include no, other dimensions that are not uh, considered consistently no, in, in, in all countries. So what I mentioned earlier in my, in my, in my previous remark was that, for example, countries, high, high income countries no, also have poor people that cannot move around no, and, and, and have other type of deprivations that are not uh, represented in the regular data. And the SDGs, of course, are a huge leap forward when compared to their predecessor Millennium Development Goals, which never had the D word in it, disability is not mentioned. Um, and the 17 mentions are helpful, um, but we're still seeing a disconnect, one, as Carlos points out, as far as thinking about what these things mean in real life, but also what they even mean in economic terms. So. UNICEF is doing some marvelous work on mapping under SDG4 and trying to figure out kids with disabilities and where they're in school and where they're not, usually they're not. 
Um, but in other places, you know, when speaking with various ministers, etc., there are some countries who say, honestly, we're not sure what to do. We've never measured disability. We've never considered it. And they're open to it. And then there are other countries who say, quite honestly, well, we've never done it. Uh, we don't know what to do. So we're just not going to do it. Um, and how you leverage the money and the programming of the SDGs to ensure that they actually do include disability and that we don't have another round of 15 years of everything about us without us, because disability is a cross-cutting issue, is one of those great challenges. And it all really brings in just that conversation of equal access to the human experience. I mean, that's what it comes down to for so many living with disabilities. And, and Carlos, you brought up, you know, friendships, access to community, access to, you know, being a part of, of the things that exist outside the door of your home and having access to that. And, and some of those are really hard to measure and quantify, but they're really important in, in the evolution of of how we become who we are. And, and in the disability community, so often those are seen as luxuries, not necessities. And, and they're not luxuries. They're, they're an everyday part of the experience that is being a human being in our society. But for some reason, at least from my personal experience and that of many I know here in the US, there is rampant discrimination against the disability community, but we don't call it discrimination. It just is what it is. And, and I think there comes a point where we need to call it what it is so we can start to address it head on and change the narrative because there's, there is still so much stigma rooted in this idea that living life with a disability, you're not a whole person. So you can't expect equal access to the entire human experience. I love that you just touched on that because ableism is a huge issue that is faced by the community in the workplace, in policy, and in everyday interactions, which Carlos touched on as well. So can we talk more about this and the importance of everyone taking ownership of unlearning ableist behavior, language, and thinking, and more specifically, how we can get that to translate into providing more equality across the board for people with disabilities? You know, Rory, I think on that, one of the biggest things is language words matter how we how we frame it matters you know you look at headlines and is it it in an article are you talking about somebody who's suffering from a spinal cord injury or are they living with a disability and that language matters because it's how we as individuals form our perceptions that we then stem and create and roll into this reality as how we see the world and so when there's a, a group that is underrepresented at large and then the few times we are represented, it's not authentically represented, and we're using language that's detrimental to changing the stigma and perception, it only continues to roll the snowball down the hill. And so how do we, how do we create a space to stop and have this very conversation we're having, but not just have it here, have it in every community, have it across all industries, have it in entertainment. I mean, my passion lies in the sports and entertainment world. And I think that the ability and the responsibility that sits in those two industries for how we play part of this conversation is, is vital. We have 2% of scripted characters on TV that live with a disability, but yet worldwide, we have 15% of our population living with one. And in that 2%, 95% of those actors and actresses are able-bodied actors and actresses portraying an individual with a disability not to mention how we villainize and make an arm difference or a limb difference scary in certain narratives. And so it only just keeps going and we need to find a place to slow down. And, and that doesn't happen until individuals with disabilities are really rooted in the conversation and a part of creative teams, developmental teams, part of the writing of scripts and every industry on down the line. And of course, that's a society-wide issue and connected to it. So we've seen a lot of movement within the corporate sphere on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with very, very few exceptions, the D word disability is not included in those endeavors. Um, if they exist at all, they're kind of lopped into corporate social responsibility, which since it has no teeth, is very less meaningless. Um, the UN Global Compact on Corporations does not include disability. The Developing Business and Human Rights Treaty, which would apply to corporations, does not include disability. 
we need to be a cross-cutting issue. We're present in all parts of society. And so the question is, how do we get that embrace of diversity, of value, of value added uh, across the board? Um, and as Mallory correctly points out, it has a lot to do as well with what we see and who we hear and who's visible. Well, I would uh, like to add that uh, we should consider also the many forms ableism has, even in the disability community. You know? uh, as you know, it is, uh, disability is a very uh, diverse experience. Uh, it implies or entails or includes many different disabilities, uh, physical, um, uh, sensory, visual, um, psychosocial disabilities, and uh, we, the uh, people with disabilities, need to have a, a very strong conscience of, about not being ableist ourselves, no, by not including other groups, no. So, for example, um, there are many, many challenges with political representations of people with intellectual disabilities. We don't see people with intellectual disabilities in political bodies or in as representatives, no. And they do uh, have a, a say, and they do have a right, you know, to participate in society. And uh, other, I don't see many communities with uh, disabilities in general, including them, or, or talking about them and, and giving them a voice, you no, know, giving giving them a space. So I, I need uh, we need to to address those issues as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And, you know, as the U.S. delegate to the G20 Youth Summit, I represented American youth aged 18 to 30. And when speaking with people with disabilities, we were talking about the importance of representation. A lot of them had told me that growing up, they were told that they didn't have a lot of career prospects because there just wasn't very much of a conversation about what is possible for people with disabilities. So I'd like to speak about the importance of representation on the screen and in the media. So from Eternals to Everything's Gonna Be Okay to that other movie music that was very controversial that recently came out. It seems like there is a lot of disability issues being discussed on the screen. And it seems like people with disabilities are in large part getting more representation on the screen, but there's still a long way to go. So can you talk about representation in the media in all of its forms and the impact of insufficient representation? How do those types of stories make an impact? The specifically the stories of struggles versus success and how that impacts people with disabilities perceptions of their own lives. You know, Rory, I'll jump in on this one for, for a second. I think that there's a lot of layers of that onion as there are in so much, so much of this conversation, right? Because we talk about intersectionality and we talk about that we in the disability community and we as just individuals are so much more than our circumstance. And so while you know, that's a part of who we are. It's not our all defining factor. And so I think there's this element of, it's not just representation on screens. It's also representation behind the camera. It's who's making up that creative team, who's on the production team, who's the DP, who's the director, who's the executive producer, who's the advisor. You can go on down the line. And if we don't have representation in those writing rooms, if we don't have representation on the ground in production, we're not going to have authentic representation be on the other side of the camera in front of it. Because even if we have a remarkable actor or actress who is an individual in the disability community, they don't have the allyship on the team on the other side who's making these creative decisions. And so I think some of it is, is when we look at disability representation, we often look at it like, you know, here's your role, here's your job within the disability space. But we are also individuals with a vast network of experience, and it's not all just rooted in the fact that we have a disability. And so when we look at that, that's really important. And that really goes into how we write these, these roles and these narratives. And then at the end of the day, that plays a big responsibility. I mean, if we all just thought of the perceptions we formed as children, it's all based on what we see. It's based on what's advertised on the billboards. It's based on what we see now on social media. It's based on what we see when we watch the news at the end of the day, what we see when we're on Netflix, Hulu, you name it, and we're streaming our favorite show. We create a reality out of the perceptions that are portrayed in front of us. And we stand no chance at changing that perception if we don't start authentically representing the disability community in that. And that goes for not just people outside of the disability community, but us internally as well. Because you know what? 
Carlos is right. We are a diverse group and I'm going to get it wrong some days. I fight against ableism every day in my community, but you know what? I'm probably ableistic at times and I don't even realize it because it's so vast and so hard to understand every element, but we have to start somewhere in this conversation to even stand a chance. I would add that the representation uh, in the movies or, or in TV series, um, I, I find uh, two, two, two issues of concern. First, misrepresentations of disabilities. No, um, that is really terrible in, in terms of uh, portraying uh, people with disabilities in a wrong way, no? in a pitiful way, uh, which is, I think, negative. And then also, I find it, um, uh, I find a, an issue of concern, the issue that every actor or actress on, on the disability um, that, that appears in the screen uh, has to do with the disability role. So why why is that so? No, uh, so like they place you in the disability box. No, so for if you're a lawyer, you must be doing a disability law. Well, I do that because I love that. No, but I could be a lawyer and and be a, a corporate lawyer or a criminal lawyer or and with actors it's the same thing. No, why can't you be an actor and portray the diversity of of, of, of the world? without falling into the disability box, no? Uh, that, that I would say also, thanks. Absolutely, and I do wanna go into that question as well about representation and specifically that representation in legislation. So as you know, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act dedicated for people with disabilities, but the US has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and so Professor Stein, I know that you were part of that team that drafted the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Can you tell us what spurred the movement on that convention and why you think the US hasn't gone and ratified it in their own national government? Well, I was part of that team with many of my wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friends. Um, and if we did a time slice and looked at the year 2001, Right, we would see the poverty rate among people with disabilities, the exclusion from education, the exclusion from the MDGs, the exclusion from the entire UN system, um, which has dramatically, dramatically changed since the CRPD's adoption. Um, but as for for the U.S., you know, it's um, you know, it's a two-sided conversation. Um, one is we can rightly point to the U.S. proclaiming, often correctly, that it's a leader in many ways in global disability movements. The idea of reasonable accommodations is one of our best exports. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, where every kid is assumed to be able to go to public school with support, period, um, is absolutely a shining light. Um, but many of us were greatly disappointed by the lack of ratification. And again, we can look at it two ways. We can look at it as there were 61 votes, which was insufficient to get Senate ratification, but that that was much better than the lack of ratification for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where the US is the only UN member state not to have ratified. Um, the same for the CEDAW, the Women's Convention, in which the US and Iran, one of the few areas in which we can agree, uh, is to suppress and to neglect women. Um, so 61 votes would seem to be a bit of a victory. On the other hand, disability has always been an across the aisle issue. And every disability law in the US on the federal level has been passed under a Republican administration and with bipartisan support. It did not exist now. And, and to give a history lesson in 30 seconds, to me, it looked like the beginning of the downfall of what we would see as highly partisan, neoclassical, abusive politics, not grounded in fact or empirical reality. Um, the reservations that came with it basically said, not basically said, we will not do anything that we were not required to do under federal law anyway. And so it was therefore a zero concession as far as changing things. Um, and yet you had Rick Sanatorium, you had the Cato Institute and you had others putting out falsehoods about how the UN is gonna come and see if your child is being educated well at home or prevent you from having guns in, in the house. Um, having said that, you know, under the current administration, we've got a breath of fresh air. 
you know, I was at the White House yesterday for the debriefing on what, again, the progress has been on disability law and, and policy. We have an administration that acknowledges our existence, uh, whereas there was an ethnic cleansing in the previous administration, disability removed from the White House website, disability coordinator fired, all disability point persons made to go poof. Um, so we have a long way to go. Um, and hopefully one day we can get that symbolic as well as somewhat practical ratification of the convention. Um, but it's a, it's a work in progress. Carlos, would you like to weigh in on this as well? And what you think the challenge well, is? Well, yeah, I think, I think it's a pity because uh, the CRPD is, uh, was, was very influenced by the Americans with Disabilities Act. No? Uh, and you can see many of the discussions that uh, were held there. Um, when, when adopting the CRPD that came from the US no, and that were influenced by the US. And it's a pity that um, the US decided not to ratify. No? Because of course, uh, the ADA goes very, very, very long, no? but uh, uh, it has elements that are not there yet. No? For example, legal capacity. As you know, the CRPD has a very strong language on, on, on legal capacity and how to get supported uh, decision making. You know? and, and it's really a pity that the US is not providing an example on ratifying the, the CRPD and other human rights uh, treatises as well, you know, I would say. Absolutely. And you know, I studied the economics and externalities of exclusion. And if you look at the linguistic differences between the parties in how they advocated for the ADA, Republicans were pushing for economic language and they were saying that it would save money in the long term, whereas the Democrats would say that it was a moral obligation. And having that difference in framing is really, really critical to know about the ADA and why it was actually passed with bipartisan support. So I guess my last question would be how do we put people with disabilities at the center of their own advocacy? And specifically, how can we get chapters to work and advocate for these issues on all levels? Well, some of us work with self-advocates around the world, including here in the United States. Um, and many of our friends here in the US, Massachusetts, New York, and, and nationwide um, are working on self-advocacy, supported decision-making, gaining their voices and seeking that. Um, but again, going back to what many of us have said, Mallory and Carlos as well, um, there is the matter of, of allyship. Um, there's the matter of creating movements and synergies with other large groups. Um, for years, the disability community has reached out to the elder community. Um, they were nowhere to be seen as far as the CRPD negotiations. Now they're negotiating their own treaty and they realize that legal capacity, access to health care, autonomy, being recognized as sexual and otherwise human beings, um, mobility, and so on and so forth, all are things in common with people with disabilities and there's an empirical overlap between it. So if you can get that demographic working together, that would be marvelous. If you can get the women's movement to understand that more than half of us with disabilities right, are, are women, um, and that this affects them, the children's movement, that these children have disabilities too, um, then you get some traction on, on political movement. But it's much easier said than done. And I bang my head against the wall in many places on this question on a daily basis. <laughs> and one element too that's important to recognize on allyship when we have that discussion is there, there's a little, I think, in our society misunderstanding when we talk about allyship of what that means. And an allyship isn't me saying, oh, I need you, let's just use disability versus somebody who doesn't live with a disability. Um, as an example, I need you, quote unquote, able-bodied individual to carry my torch for me and, and fight my fights. I don't, I don't need that. I need allyship as a community. We need allyship to get society to help remove these barriers so we can carry this torch forward that we've long been carrying as a community. And so I think sometimes there's some misunderstanding when we talk about allyship, but we don't fully educate ourselves on what does that actually mean? And, and it's not having other people fight your battles for you. It's having other people understand that this is a valid battle that needs to be fought. And it's in the best interest of all of us that we move this needle forward. Because as we said at the beginning, 61 million adults in the U.S. live with a disability. We have 15%, that's 1 billion people worldwide. That is a massive demographic to just leave, leave on the side. 
And so we need to kind of create that environment where, where allyship is bringing all voices in and supporting that and creating a space. And sometimes allyship is also stepping back and realizing you're not the right person to be speaking to this. And there's somebody better equipped to do that and helping amplify their voice. I would, I would only add that we need to uh, promote you know, and, uh, and, and support you know, emergent activism from, from younger people with disabilities. You know? uh, so I think it is super, in Human Rights Watch, we have a program that's called the Marco Bristow Fellowship in honor of, of uh, you all know Marco Bristow, of course. And we grant an emergent activist uh, a, a, a fellowship no, for him to go to New York City and be trained on, on how to promote uh, uh, disability rights more effectively. So how to make research, how to make advocacy, how to um, uh, speak with the press, you know. And uh, this year we, we granted that fellowship to uh, Mr. Brian Russell from Peru, you know, who's a, a man with Down syndrome and who is uh, making activism uh, and advocacy in many Latin American countries on political participation of uh, people with intellectual disabilities. So he's going to come here to Mexico and speak to, to authorities here about uh, the efforts they need to make to include uh, people with intellectual disabilities as candidates for political positions. I love that. And I think that that's a really important way of putting people with disabilities at the center of their own advocacy. I guess my last question would be, if people wanted to learn more about these issues, how would you suggest that they go about it? How do you suggest that they go about educating themselves on these particular issues so that they can be effective advocates and allies? Well, there are any number of available and free resources online for people to access. Um, ranging from ours at the HPOD website in multi-languages to Human Rights Yes, to the International Disability Alliances materials, to uh, Inclusion International, which is creating a platform for activities. Um, they can reach out to their local organizations of persons with disabilities, which is often a wonderful idea because they can help increase their local support group and connections, going back to what Carlos was saying about friendship and Mallory was saying about local communities and being outside. Um, it's really just a matter of reaching out a little bit um, and the disability community reaching back as well. I would say in addition to that, one thing that's important, and, and maybe this is me speaking to the younger generation a little bit, but social media is has such an impact on how we interpret the world around us. And so there's a little bit to be said about who do you follow? What's the feed that you look at every day that's made up of? Is it a bunch of people that look like you, that talk like you, that think like you, and that do like you? Or is it a diverse group of thoughts and conversations that are happening within your feed? And I understand that some of social media is pure entertainment value, but again, to the conversation we've had, if our entertainment value is all one way of thinking, that is how we form our perception. And that is how we look to the world around us. And so there's the element of how do we understand law and policy and advocacy? And that is a very, very important part of this conversation. But then there's also the conversation of what are we consuming on a daily basis? What is the information that's at our fingertips and how are we changing that? I wouldn't be a um, proud Paralympian without giving the Paralympic movement a bit of a plug here in the effort of saying, well, the Paralympic movement probably doesn't always get it right. I know we strive to, but just like I said, I as an individual don't always get it right. Um, the Paralympic movement has a really powerful way to show, not tell and change perception to what we were talking about earlier of disability and human potential and what individuals with disabilities can do. Because we so often as a society, somebody you know walks into a room with a cane, somebody wheels in, somebody talks a little bit different, whatever it might be that we say is quote unquote different from what we assume should be kind of how we communicate and how we navigate. And we instantly look at that as a hindrance. We don't look at that as something that can actually create ability within itself. And so that's where I love the power of sport because visually it completely flips it upside down on its head. And it, it begs us to ask the question of why are we perceiving this as something that creates a barrier, 
outside of societal, but individually versus something that actually inhibits ability. And so I think that the Paralympic movement is such a powerful way to do that. So I think it's a lot of too what you what you consume and what it is that you're watching and and reading on a daily basis. I love that. And that actually leads us to our audience questions. So right now you've talked about representation and I'm currently reading a book on called Limitless by Mallory Wegman. But I'd like to know from you guys, what are some of the books, shows or research that you're consuming right now centered on persons with disabilities and their stories? And this is actually coming from the audience as well. So not just me wanting to know, but they also want to know. I would recommend Notes on Blindness. No, uh, you can. It's a show. That you, it's a it's a movie that you can see on Netflix. It also is a beautiful book. You no, know, that accounts for the experience of being blind. Uh, so it is such a inspiring uh, work, and it really takes you, you no, know, to those places that you you wouldn't imagine. You no, know, that exist in in in, in being blind and uh, and and the challenges, but also. The poetry, you no, know, of 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 accounting of, on how on how to experience how well, having that experience and the fear, you no, know, of course. Yeah. Um, media wise, I was visited and and I'm reading "I Am In Here" by Elizabeth Bonker and her mom, um, and has glorious poetry in it as well, and it describes the thinking and feelings of a, of a young woman with autism who you may have seen recently on the Netflix, whatever it is, autism love show or whatever, whatever it's called. But um, in, my, in my work life, we are working more with uh, our friends with, with, uh, and self-advocates with intellectual disabilities to publish research with them so that we project their voices. Um, and you know, we got to publish in the Harvard Law Review, the most prestigious law journal, and we did it with the self-advocates and they were the lead authors and it's their voices and their stories that are leading and we're trying to do more of that. I have other work like it, including some Palestinian work and, and other areas of the globe. Yeah, we also have CODA that came out just this year and, and is, it's really interesting. I was actually just reading an article about it the other day um, in Variety Magazine and just the authentic representation that took place there and how, I mean, we are, we're, we're yearning for that. And, and with each, each piece of content that does it and gets it right and shows the power of it, it continues to push that needle, right? And so it's just, um, I think there's, there's a lot to be said. And again, it, it changes that perception, right? That's about the, the hearing impaired community and, and changing that narrative. It's a, child who has two two deaf parents and so but yet a hearing child and so I think that sometimes you know I I know even personally in the Paralympic movement teammates who um have different forms of dwarfism and are little people and and their conversation in that of you know it's like just because I'm I'm an LP doesn't mean my parents are I'm the only LP in my family and and we assume that within the disability community we all keep with each other you know, it's like we assume because I'm a woman with a disability, my husband must be an individual with a disability as well. That's actually not the case. And so, you know, I think that there's some of this where when we see that crossover, it shows that, again, we aren't just to the conversation earlier put in this box of here's what the disability experience is like for individuals living with disabilities. And you are to stay here, live here, be here, do here. And that's all you'll ever experience. Um, and so I think in in media, it's really interesting to also see that perspective in real life stories and portrayed in an authentic way. I love that question. So then there's the next, then there's the next point about how we essentially focus on different issues within the disability community. And I know that you talked about representation. I know that you talked about the, the importance of authentic representation as well. And I guess our audience wants to know uh, specifically how we can facilitate the conversations and spe about specific issues within the disability rights community. Are there some things that need more attention in the media? Are there some things that need more attention in advocacy? And specifically, what do you recommend on ways to facilitate, how do you recommend facilitating intersectional and um, giving each of these issues equal attention? 
Well, you know, I'll, I'll speak only for myself and say we all fail at being adequately representative and adequately inclusive. We all work on it. It's a holy grail. We all seek it and pursue it, um, but we never quite get it right. Um, whether it's looking at the UN document, and I've been thinking a lot about that over the last few years, and where are the indigenous voices, and you know, where are some other voices, um, or whether it's you know disability movements to ensure that everyone is there. Um, we've gotten some good pushback over the last three to five years in the U.S. on persons of color um, and others within our disability movements, so that it's not all about being a white, physically disabled person, although there's nothing wrong with being a white, physically disabled person. But the idea that we make sure to be inclusive and intersectional, it means all of us being very introspective and very aware of who's in the room and, and who isn't in the room, virtual or otherwise. Um, but it's always going to be a work in progress. And hopefully when it's on the agenda, we can all move better towards a better outcome. Well, I would say that uh, a pressing, pressing issue that we need to consider is uh, how to really, really change the way in which we um, take care of uh, so-called um, a mental health crisis, you know, and uh, how to provide really strong community support uh, people experiencing emotional distress. You now, um, right now, in in many cities in North America, we are uh, talking about um, the, the the fact that police is the one who responds as first respondents to mental health crisis. And that creates a, a huge risk for people experiencing this, 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 um, this, 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 uh, this, this experiences now. So um, alternatives to that, I would say are, are needed and we need to think on how to build better now this responses, I would say that. We have another audience question uh, specifically for Mallory. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about the Paralympics and its impact on infrastructure and communities and specifically how we can encourage uh, and how we can promote disability employment after the Paralympics? You know, it's a really powerful conversation we have in the movement. When you look at the Olympic and Paralympic games, one of the conversations that naturally comes out as criticism towards the movement is the the infrastructural burden on host countries who are hosting the Olympics and, and the detriment of what, what happens to facilities after the massive financial and economic undertaking to host the games and all the different elements. But what's interesting and what we kind of raise our hand on the Paralympic side of the coin and say, yes, but in the Paralympic movement, the growth that happens after, whether it's from purely infrastructural developments that happen in order to host a games, look at the London 2012 games as a great example of changes that were made within London to make it a more accessible city in preparations for hosting the Paralympics. And then what that did is those changes, they stay when the games are done. They're not temporary fixes, they're permanent. The tube is more accessible than it was prior to the London 2012 games purely because they had to create more accessibility as they prepared for the London games. But that stays in place for years to come. And so then you have that, but then you also flip the coin back to this conversation of perception. And when you do that, you see how, when a games are hosted in a host country, how many thousands of volunteers come out, how much coverage it gets in the host country and on down the line. And the change of societal perception in terms of disability, and how that correlates into society and creating more opportunities in employment after the fact. Because one of the barriers we have in the disability community for many isn't the, I mean, yes, it is getting your physical body in the door because sometimes it's purely infrastructural challenges where it's not accessible, but it's also the 
the inaccessibility to get your body in the door and not be judged based on the first look or face first look at the piece of paper. And so one of the things that has to happen is when we change that stigma, we open that theoretical door for greater opportunities because now we've had an event that has started to change the narrative and stigma in society around disability in a positive way that starts to illuminate human potential and see that for what it is and allow greater access on the back end. And so we've actually seen with the London 2012 games, there's been a lot of research put into it and seen the increase in employment and the change in societal perception around disability since the London 2012 games and how that has changed. And so we in the US look to LA 2028. And that is our that is our gold standard that we are marching towards. And in the Paralympic movement, we are seeing steps that are changing leaps and bounds. The USOPC renamed themselves from the US Olympic Committee to the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. We have pay equity. Olympic gold medals are paid at the same rate that Paralympic gold medals are and vice versa. We used to be a fifth and now we're equal. They didn't even like stepping stone it, they just took it all the way. And so I think that that's so important as we see more brands integrate to what that does in changing the conversation. And so it's certainly my hope that by LA and following LA, we get to see a powerful legacy in seeing that, that conversation evolve and see the long-term impact that the Paralympics has off the field of play. Thank you so much for that. That is so important to focus on and thinking about the pay equity, especially as we in the US have the Fair Labor Standards Act, which allows companies to pay disabled workers at half of the minimum wage. Um, so I do think that disability employment is so important and having that representation in the Paralympics is so critical. So thank you for your work on that, really. Uh, we have one last audience question, which is for all of our panelists. How can we expand this discussion globally? When considering programming and development intervention, in interventions that support the SDGs, how should disability be considered to ensure that benefits reach communities at its margins? Any speaker who wants to jump in? Professor Stein, would you like to go first? Well, I find it an, an, an odd question because most of us who are working on uh, international disability rights are working on linking with local communities on all aspects of human rights and trying to pull together the different areas, whether it's CRPD, SDGs, habitat, building back better, climate change, and so on and so forth. Um, just an understanding holistically that people with disabilities are part of the world and therefore it's all about us and nothing about us without us. Well, I would I would say that uh, we need to um, sort of like promote you know, that in all studies about human rights, uh, disability rights are included. You no, know? so in Human Rights Watch, we try to do that. As you know, we are a lot of divisions. We work that work in different issues. You no, know? LGBT or women's rights or or children's rights. And we also, uh, we always uh, encourage our fellow researchers that to include disabilities in their, in their, in their design memos, not to start um, this, uh, this uh, re kind of research. Um, and as Professor Stein said, uh, uh, it is important that in the emerging issues, no, we need to include also uh, disability rights and, and people with disabilities. And Mallory, do you want to weigh in on that? You know, I think the my perspective, obviously, right, I just got done talking about the Paralympics. And one of the things when I talked to when I heard you ask how we expand this discussion globally, my brain went to is one of the emotions every four years we feel when we go into a village and we see athletes from all different parts of the world, many of whom use medical devices for accessibility and, and means of transportation to get around and for mobility and how many don't have adequate access. And it is, it's very interesting because <clears throat> in those countries, if they're making it to the Paralympic games, they're considered like they're, they're shining stars, if you will. And their lack of access to adequate mobility devices that just is the fundamental means of getting from point A to point B 
is so minimal. And so it's, it's just one of those things where I guess my answer is, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I say I'm young in this. I'm, I'm 13 years into my paralysis and I'm, I'm new to this. I can, you guys could run or wheel or however you get around circles around me on policy. And, and that's an area that's so green to me in so many ways. But I think that when having this discussion, it is important we look at it globally. And I know so many are putting their life's work into that and figuring out how we do this. Um, but it becomes a question that every time I go to an international competition, I ask myself, why is it that I have this beautiful high-end manual chair that is like a glove on my backside and allows me to maneuver with so much ease and I look at my counterparts from other parts of the world and they can hardly even wield their chair because it's so wide and it's falling apart. And how are we setting them up for success in their lives, personally, professionally, and otherwise for this equal access to the human experience we talk about, if that's the means of mobility that they're given. Thank you so much. That is such an important, important thing to recognize. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Angela to provide some advocacy asks and take it from here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for such an amazing discussion. I hope everyone in the audience had uh, learned just as much as I did about today's topics. Um, and so if you feel inspired and would love to help out in the amazing work that everyone is doing, um, then I'm going to drop this link in the chat. Or thank you, Katrina. And uh, we would love if you could urge your representative to reaffirm your, our country's commitment to the UDHR, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, through the link where you would just fill in some uh, simple information to determine who your representative is, or you can text UDHR to 30644. Furthermore, if you'd like to become an original co-sponsor or receive more information on the resolution, you can also contact Andrew Bower and Representative Alan Lowenthal's office um, at this link below, at this email below. Um, and the deadline is tonight. So um, if you'd like to co-sponsor, feel free to do so within the next 12 hours or so. Um, but all of this would be sent automatically. Uh, we hope this streamlines the process um, in order to try to achieve more equitable solutions for people with varying types of disabilities, as well as um, all human rights agendas around the country. So thank you so much again, um, and I'll pass it over to Joshua. Aloha. It's great to see everyone and want to really thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we think it's so important on the anniversary of UDHR to focus on inclusivity. And I really think it's great to bring athletes, activists, academics, coming together, artists to show the world of what is possible. I love really Mallory's statement of equal access to the human experience. I think that summarized it so well. And when we look at what we can do next, it is absolutely true. I think the UDHR is that foundational document but we need to make sure that the US doesn't have that record of ratification of only three instruments. We definitely should ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this was brought up during the Universal Periodic Review of the United States just one year ago on November 9th, 2020. So it's one of the areas we can concentrate on to make sure that we realize the recommendations from the UPR. And the last time it was even raised was when was bringing even Senator Bob Dole to participate and still that didn't happen. So we really think UN CRPD should be a priority and we ask you to get involved and also get involved with the other 346 recommendations made in the UPR last year so that in four years, we can see that we've made progress to make sure we can realize all human rights for all. Thank you again very much. And it was an honor to be with everyone. Rory, great to see you. It's great to see also the work we're doing come to fruition in this important space. Mahalo.